spring, 1978, two young filmmakers, John Carpenter and Deborah Hill, began shooting a film about a babysitter being stalked by evil incarnate. Shot in 20 days, on a budget of just over 300,000, the film went on to make over 50 million, and until recently, was the highest grossing independent movie ever. It's influenced a generation of filmmakers and film goers, and its title has become synonymous with movie horror, Halloween. Today, Deborah Hill is a player, one of the busiest producers in LA, but she remembers Halloween. What I like about horror films is the fact that they really get you to react. For me, the films were a way to kind of leap from reality into some sort of great fantasy. We're all afraid of the same things. We're all born afraid of, of death, of loss of loved ones, loss of, of, of abandonment from our parents, pain, injury, all of it is the same. We're all afraid of the same things, which makes a movie that deals in our fears uh, universal. One of my first jobs was a script supervisor uh, working on a movie called Goodbye Norma Jean. And then I met John Carpenter when he directed Assault on Precinct 13. And I was his script supervisor and assistant editor. And then we decided to collaborate on Halloween. Erwin Yablons actually came up with the idea of setting it in Halloween. And we were searching for a story, you know, what could the story be? And, and because we were very limited, in fact, they wanted babysitters. So, and I'd been a babysitter and I had all these great stories. Um, but when he called and came up with the brilliant idea of using the themes of Halloween to tell our story, uh, it was like a, a gold mine. I thought, what if we made a film in one night? We could probably do it real cheap because we'd use one set, we'd do it all in a couple of days or a couple of weeks. And, and I thought about the most horrific night of the year, Halloween. No one had ever made a movie about Halloween. And I picked up a telephone and called John Carpenter, with whom, who, who, who was in my mind at the time because of Assault on PC-13. And I said, what do you think of the title Halloween? Expecting him to perhaps balk, he got it right away. And he told me right off the bat that he could make the picture for four weeks for $300,000. I said, John, let me see what I can do. I wasn't in this horror films until John Carpenter came to me with this film. And and he said, I have a film, and uh, low budget, and he said, $300,000. I said, $300,000? He said, well, yeah. And I said, what's the story about? He said, it's uh, about a babysitter to be killed by the boogeyman. The word babysitter clicked with me, because every kid in America knows what a babysitter is. We went to a list of scares, you know, like imagine if, you know, you're in bed with your boyfriend and he goes down to get some water or a Coke or something and comes back with a sheet trying to pretend he's a ghost, but it's not him. It's all these kinds of things that we wrote down, all these scares, and then we decided to weave the scares into the story. Basically, it was a complete 50-50 collaboration. I wrote the first draft laying in the kids, the teenagers, the teenage talk, the girl talk amongst each other. And John came back with a pass for the Sam Loomis character, which was played by Donald Pleasance. So all the stuff about evil and everything is really John's. I met this six-year-old child with this blank, pale, emotionless face and the blackest eyes, the devil's eyes. The opening shot of the picture um, took an entire day to film. It's actually two shots. We took it from Touch of Evil, um, one of our favorite Orson Welles films. We set up so that we would start in the front of the house and we would actually go all the way through, creep in the window, see them kissing, go through the back of the house, open up the drawer, pick out the knife, and by the way, those were my hands. And then we would go in through the living room and up the steps and into the bedroom. And while we were up there shooting that scene, um, Downstairs, all the electricians and grips were running around crazy trying to reset the lights for when we turned around and came back through the house. The fact that we had a new tool at the time to, to kind of help us with that, the Steadicam, it was pretty ambitious because uh, most of the time on low-budget shows you didn't really spend a lot of time with the look. Every town has a haunted house, and in Haddonfield, it belongs to the Myers family. We slept up there 
anybody who's a fan of the film remembers Nancy Loomis. Hello. I'd like to tell you that a lot of mysterious, weird things happened or that we had this big passionate love scene, but in fact, as soon as everybody was gone and we got up there, we just sort of looked at each other and we're so tired, we just conked out the end. Not quite. The Halloween crew used other locations in and around Pasadena. All right, what you're looking at is the original Halloween street. And uh, I felt like this had the look we needed. Uh, overhanging trees, could be anywhere. And yet on film, they don't look like rich people live here. They just like Beaver Cleaver lives here. The filmmakers also use the stately homes of West Hollywood. Hi, I'm Brian Andrews, Tommy Doyle from the Halloween. Over there was Lindsay's house. That was the house where I first saw the boogeyman. And I got to tell you, that really scared me. Over here, we have the Doyle house. I'd like to apologize to everyone for taking so long to get to the door and leaving poor Jamie Lee Curtis stranded out there, possibly in fear for her life. A lot of Halloween's success was due to the creative partnership between its director and cinematographer. Dean and I sat down and watched Chinatown. There is a real creepy feeling to Chinatown in the way it's shot. It's beautiful, it's sunlit, it's California, but on the other hand, there's something really off about it. And so we talked about this being a small town that's something strange here. He did a whole lot of blue backlight, okay? He, creepy, creepy light, and it was really effective. It became a kind of cliche after he used it. Jamie Lee has been chased in the house and she's hiding in the corner and the, uh, the shape, as we called him, uh, gradually sort of materializes in the shadows behind her using a, a light on a dimmer. Uh, I brought it, brought it up so that it just barely began to expose the white face of the, uh, of the shape, the killer, hiding in the background there. I always remember uh, John Carpenter and Deborah Hill seemed always, you know, very preoccupied with getting everything perfect. They seemed like the ultimate, incredible, down-home filmmakers because they had hands on everything. And John Carpenter just seemed like a genius to me because he really knew so, so much about what he wanted from every single second of the film. Veteran actor Donald Pleasance came in for five shooting days to portray the shape's nemesis, Dr. Sam Loomis. Donald Pleasance was just an amazing actor. Um, he, he really, he's the kind of guy who just knew the character. Um, we only had five days with him. He was just really great. He gave 150%. And he was like the elder on the set. Those days, kids making movies was rare. And so I think he was just astonished at our ages and the excitement um, and the freshness that we brought to the process. John and Deborah called me one day and said to me that they were all set on offering Christopher Lee the part of Dr. Loomis. I said, what do you want to do, make another Hammer movie? Christopher Lee turned us down, Peter Cushing turned us down, and Donald uh, agreed to my shock. And we sat down to have lunch and he says, I don't understand this script, I don't like this script, I don't know who my character is, the only reason I'm doing this is because my daughter thought your first movie was cool. So tell me why I'm doing this, I'm scared to death. Oh my God. And I only realized later when we became friends that what Donald likes to do is he wants to be, he wants to find out how much you want to do the movie. He wants to find out how you, how passionate I am, you are, as the director. And so that's his little trick. Donald, his action is he runs and he shoots the shape, blows him out of a window. On the set I was shooting his reaction. So he says, I can play this, what do you want me to do? I can play this two ways. I can play this, uh, oh my God, he's gone, or I knew this would happen. I thought, boy, that's interesting. I don't know. Can you play it, do it both ways for me? And um, <clears throat> clearly he knew what he should have done. He, sh he knew how he should have played it ahead of time, it, which it was I knew this would happen. Because, oh my God, he's gone was way too, too much. But I realized that Donald actually gave me the choice, you see. He left the decision in my hands, which is, the, I don't know, the mark of a great actor. While Halloween was Pleasance's 108th film or TV appearance, it was his co-star's first movie role. I remember that the first day we shot, I remember exactly what we shot. 
And I remember going home and thinking I was going to be fired. I just thought I sucked and that, you know. And I remember being at home and my roommate said, Jamie, the phone's for you. It's John Carpenter. And I thought, oh, man, this is it. And he called to say how happy he was with the day's work. And I just thought that was great. That's never happened to me again. We saw a lot of girls to play the Laurie Strode character. And Jamie was just so vulnerable and so real and so fresh. So she really didn't come with sort of the acting chops that most of the young girls were portraying at the time. She just was real and fresh. And she so wanted the role. And, and Deborah came up with the idea of Jamie. Jamie was in. Uh a little TV show, I think. She was under contract at Universal. And uh, Deborah thought it would be a great idea to cast her, plus the fact that she was Janet Lee's daughter, which kind of connected back to Psycho. So I have to give Deborah all the credit in the world for that. And the fact that we had named the Donald Pleasance character after Sam Loomis, who was, you know, her boyfriend in Psycho. For those reasons, Jamie got the part. I remember the feeling about it more than anything. It wasn't like something happened on the set. You know, we're working hard. Um, everybody was very young. Uh, we were shooting in an incredibly fast pace. Uh, the entire makeup, wardrobe, prop department was in a tiny Winnebago. Here I was with these 18, 19, 20, 22 year old guys, primarily. And a lot of people's girlfriends and friends and family all creating this, this movie. So that remains the thing that was special about it for me. Whenever you make a horror movie, you have a great deal of fun. If you make a drama or a comedy, it's, it's a nightmare. It's ugly. It's horrible, okay? Because the subject matter, everybody gets very serious, especially comedies. Boy, they're tough. But a horror movie, everybody starts loosening up, and the more blood you bring out, the more fun it is, the more people get killed. Every The crew is laughing and joking. It's like a picnic. And so that whole feeling uh, was kind of rolling through Halloween. Halloween's villain was more than just a killer. It was a supernatural hurricane. What I thought about doing was not giving the antagonist, Michael Myers, really much of a backstory, but kind of kicking him up into a, I don't know, legendary kind of, of situation where he's much more like an element of nature. Because I thought that would be more frightening rather than personifying, make him almost a force. So then the mask, which ties in with Halloween, would blank out his human features for most of the film, making him then uh, just some, some sort of force of evil that is uh, irrational, unstoppable. But the shape had to be more than just some guy in a fright mask. Nick Castle had been a schoolmate of John's at um, USC. Nick had a wife and, and I believe two babies. I know there was at least one, it may have been two. And they came by every day at lunch, and you know, here's this guy you know, with this over suit on, and you know, the mask was just always lying next to him. He'd put it on and go do the work. His portrayal of shape. Now remember, the shape has no lines in the movie, none whatsoever. It's just sort of a, you know, a mask, and it's a presence that we wanted. On Halloween two, we had a stuntman play the role, and even though he studied the 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 Nick Castle kind of feeling, he could never quite get it. I think they're trying to make it more important than it really is. I actually just walked. Uh, John actually did say something, you know, I like the way you walk, I think it'll be good. Now maybe John thinks of me as a serial killer, I don't know. I remember I'm about to walk across the street in the first shot, and I realize he has not told me anything about what I'm supposed to do as this character. So I came up to him and basically asked him, what's my motivation, you know, as the shape walking across? How do you want me to walk, you know? How do you want me to, am I supposed to be this or that? And he said, Nick, just walk. Nick was suggesting all sorts of, of attributes uh, that he could play to this character, thinking, okay, is, is he really a psychop? Is he really crazy? Is he somebody who's insane? Does he have any of the the kind of uh, schizophrenic movements that we, we kind of associate with mental illness. And I just told him to be simple with it. Basically, with it, when he's watching something or someone uh, stand still, uh, just move very gracefully because Nick can do that. Make this, this killer almost a blank slate that we can project everything into and make it much more horrifying. I am actually in this movie without the mask on. Uh, 
early on when the Michael Myers escapes from the hospital, uh, he jumps on a car, right, and he smashes the car window. It was raining that night. It was supposed to be raining that night. It was very cold that night, and all I had on was my underwear and this um, hospital gown. And I didn't know they were, it was supposed to rain. This is three in the morning, you know, maybe 40-something degrees, and all of a sudden, someone yells, Dean Cundy, that little rat, probably yelled, turn on the hoses. And they turned on the hoses, you know, they didn't bother to warm up the water or anything like that. And I remember the feeling of ice cold water hitting my body through the hospital gown. And then they had to do take after take. And I'm sure there was no film on the camera. I'm sure the first take was perfect and they were just doing it to torture me. I think he really gave the movie something. I think there's little moments that he does in the movie that are really special that, you know, take it away from being just some sort of thug in a suit. He really kind of, at one point, he tips his head and kind of looks at his handiwork. And I remember when I, when I stabbed the kid up against the refrigerator or something, boom, you know, uh, stabbed the kid, and uh, I remember that direction. John said, tilt your head this way, tilt your head that way, like you're looking at him. And everyone loves that. Well, he was so agile and subtle. And he made a great shape because of that. Well, I needed to go pick up some trick-or-treat shots, second unit. And so, and I wanted them where trick-or-treaters went by and suddenly there stands the shape. So not only was I going to direct the second unit, but I brought the costume and I was going to be the shape. So I put this shape costume on and of course I'm so much tinier than, than Nick. And in dailies it was so hilarious because the shape had shrunk. One of the most famous faces in horror almost had a completely different look. John assigned me the task of finding some choices for the Halloween mask. And I picked up two that looked like really good, legit choices. One was an Emmett Kelly mask. Emmett Kelly was a classic clown with a big red nose, stupid hair, and a big smile, big blue smile on his face. And I thought, how frightening, how grotesque. The first Michael Myers mask um, was actually a William Shatner from Star Trek uh, mask um, that we kind of changed a lot. We opened up the eye sockets, we changed the hair, uh, we did uh, something to the skin tones to make it this white pasty kind of uh, mask. And it was kind of scary because it was sort of featureless. And that's what we were just, what we're going for. And uh, first it was the Emmett Kelly mask and he came out of the bathroom wearing it, and everyone agreed it was pretty eerie. It was strange. It was weird. Un made you uncomfortable, and you knew that was a scary situation. Went back, came out with the other mask, and a cold chill ran up everybody's spine. It was so scary looking. It was so demented. It was so sick that we knew we had it. I wasn't impressed with the mask at first. I thought the mask was fake. I thought it was phony. I didn't like it. I thought the mask wouldn't work, but I was wrong. <laughs> for the only time in the series, Michael's face is revealed for a split second on camera. For that one shot, we brought in an actor, imported, you know, uh, a guy who hadn't been part of it, uh, and did the reveal to, uh, as I remember, he was sort of a blonde, um, you know, nondescript sort of face, uh, almost uh, sort of the other side of the Captain Kirk mask was, you know, a nondescript uh, face. But this kid had, had a youngish looking face, okay. And I don't even remember who he is now. But all, what he had to do was take the mask off and react. I think he'd been stabbed or, or something in the face. And people read into that, his face, much more horror than is there. There really isn't much to it. It's just a kid. The film's lack of blood was offset by one of its most distinguishing features, Carpenter's brilliantly menacing score. I had to do the music to Halloween in about three days. I, mean, I had to do the whole score so I could go in and perform it and get out. My dad had taught me uh, five, four time on, on a set of bongos when I was young. So just to teach me some rhythms. They're not four, four time, it's off one. And so I decided just to do that on a, as an octave on a piano. I've never seen a movie completely transform. I learned a great lesson about the power of music and sound effects and sound on that picture. I know it's true of every picture, but in this film, it made 
a quantum leap. It, it, there's no way to describe the difference between. In fact, if you want to explain it to yourself, try watching the movie one time with the sound off. And later on, by the way, when I watch this picture with audiences, and we watched it, I watched it many, many times, I used to see young people at the most horrific times in the film watch the screen but clamp their hands over the ears. And I never understood that. I asked my son about that one day. He said, that's what we all do. He said, because it's, the sound is too scary. When the film was finished, no one expected what happened next. The first theatrical engagement of Halloween was in Kansas City in four theaters. And we had a very modest campaign. I remember getting the first phone call on Friday night about midnight and finding out that we'd done $200 a theater. And I went to bed that night thinking, well, it'll get distributed. We'll do all right. The next night, we'd gone to $800 a theater. The following night, we'd gone to $1,600 a theater. And by the end of the week, we were doing $1,500 to $2,000 a theater. I've never seen word of mouth spread like it did in Kansas City. I, it was the most exhilarating experience. Everybody was surprised by its success. And it didn't succeed right away. It was something that built over, you know, three or four months. Um, and even then, it wasn't, it wasn't like I walked down the street and people were going, hey, Laurie Strode, all right. I mean, again, 1978, you know, it just, it certainly did very, very well. And, and it made, you know, a lot of other people a lot of money. Um, uh, and for me, it gave me a movie career. Most pictures, you know, they open and they go down. In this picture, it was just the opposite. It opened and went up. There were two exhibitors in Boston that I used to sell pictures to, and I, they had made me some money on Halloween. They called me up and they asked me, Erwin, how did you make the picture? How much did it cost? How do you do it? What do you do? The next thing I know, they hired, a, they hired a young filmmaker, and they took the picture and practically shot it frame for frame. Another man came along and hired Jamie Lee Curtis and made a picture called Terror Train, which just about duplicated Halloween <laughs> on a train. And so it went. Finally, I, I, I turned to my partners and I said, you know, this is nuts. We've got to make another Halloween. First time I saw the film with an audience, it was, uh, I think it's called the Egyptian Theater. It was in Hollywood, the kind of seedy part of Hollywood, Hollywood and Vine. It wasn't fixed up then. And I, had, uh, I was with Dennis and um, sitting in like third or fourth row and just wanted to see it with a, a regular kind of audience. And there was this really big guy sitting behind me. And when that scene came up where I say, see, see anything you, you like, like, like this, the guy behind me goes, hot damn! You bet your ass I do. <laughs> one person I'll never forget in Boston. We we screened the film one time, and uh, it was a it was a large audience. And by the by the by the fourth resurrection, somebody yelled out, "You dumb bitch! You deserve to die." I think the simplicity of the story and the way it was told is what made the movie really unique. How many twenty-year-old pictures do you have? that keep their popularity. Halloween is the gone with the wind of the horror movies. The last shot of the film, looking down at the, at the, gra the empty grass there, and then a little montage of all the places we've been, evil never dies. You can't kill it. He has no uh, morality. You don't know where it's coming from. It's just, so it's just, uh, it's, it's, it's your deepest, darkest fear. <laughs> Sadly, Michael Myers passed away this week, the real Michael Myers. He was the distributor in London who had um, distributed Assault on Precinct 13. He was very sweet and dear. and He was confused. He said, what do you see about my personality? Why did you, why did you do this? But I told him that it was a tribute because he basically started my career. He may be the only mass murderer who's on a first name basis with movie audiences around the world. I couldn't believe the, 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 the fans that are really so addicted to these Halloweens. They know so much about it, more than I do, as far as details and the family relationship and the story and the, the cast and the costumes, and they want to know who is playing Michael Myers, the one next. I get letters from people that still, that, that that what they say is, Mr. Castle, we love your work, we love your uh, direction on The Last Starfighter. Boy, Major Payne was really funny. Can you sign this picture of the shape, please? I get at least four or five letters a week, and um, 
carry Halloween stripes, Rock and Roll High School, but they always talk about Halloween. I wear my Halloween pin with great pride. You know, I, I tried very hard through 22 now years of making movies to always hold up Halloween and say, you know, A, it was the best experience I ever had. It was by far, up until uh, True Lies, the best part I ever had. Um, you know, I, I tried to point out the irony that in those exploitation movies, I was intelligent, uh, forthright, fought back against adversity, um, and was the lead in those movies for that role. Halloween redefined the horror film and opened the doors for two decades worth of imitators. But none have had the impact or the nail-biting effectiveness of Michael Myers, because real terror stands the test of time. You know, in every script they want to kill him, they want to destroy him. I tell them, wait a minute, Michael Myers. I love this guy. As I was on some tour for something and they showed it to a bunch of college kids, I've never heard anything like it. The place was going nuts. It was ape shit. And I'm outside the door thinking, this is fantastic. How great. Uh, it was made it all worthwhile. That was what they were supposed to do, scream their, scream their lungs out.